Welcome back to another episode, and today we're going to talk about Bancor's token BNT. We're going to look into the economics of the BNT token. Last year, I wrote a report on the token economics of BNT, and as you can imagine, economics is a very dynamic skill set. It's a very dynamic field of science, of soft science, and it continuously evolves. So just because we have in a report or we have a structure that was designed a couple of years ago or just 12 months ago, it doesn't mean that the system doesn't change. The system can change in two ways, which affects the evaluation or just affects the behaviors of people when they interact with the token itself. The first one is the increased number of users or the different types of users in the ecosystem. And the second thing is the mechanisms, the incentive mechanisms in play, new, new or improved mechanisms. So today we're going to talk about Bancor because Bancor, Bancor just released a version 2.1 on the Bancor ecosystem. And we're going to look into that to understand how that impacts the token price or the token design of the BNT token. The cool thing about this is that right now they have included something different. At the end of the day, Bancor is an exchange. It's an, it has this mechanism called Automated Market Maker, which there are plenty of videos that you can watch more about. This time, this new version of 2.1 is quite a different version because they are trying to reduce impermanent loss by providing insurance. And this is where the BNT token comes in handy. So we're going to take a look at that. We're going to cover five things today. The first one is explaining Bancor in 60 seconds. I hope I can do that. The second is what is Bancor? So what is Bancor V2.1? So there's Bancor V1, Bancor V2, and now it's 2.1. Then we're going to go to a simple whiteboard session to understand what is, how do they get zero in permanent loss and what is the insurance they are, they, that they are providing. It's very different from Nexus insurance. It's a different kind of insurance and a completely different kind of risk. So that's interesting and we're going to take a look at that later. Then we're going to look at the economics of BNT token and we're going to conclude with some FAQ questions about the new economic system and economics design of the, of the BNT token. Okay, so Bangkok in 60 seconds. Think of Bangkok like a cookie jar. In a cookie jar, you have two types of cookies. Halloween is just around the corner, and you have cookies with cookie, pumpkin cookies, one with leaves and one without leaves. The one with leaves are the ones of the BNT tokens, and the one without leaves are like the Lisa tokens. So we have these two types of cookies in the cookie jar. What I can do is to trade cookies. So I can add more of the BNT token and remove the Lisa tokens. So that means I'm trading the BNT token for the Lisa token. That's, it. That's the general idea. That's how these systems work. And people will be putting their, their pumpkin tokens in with, with the curly leaves or without the curly leaves, the two different kind of designs, so the two different kind of tokens. And that's it. That's the entire core crux of the system. So what, what's different then? What's different? This is very different from... So then, what is the Bangkok V2.1? And you probably have already heard how this is different from Uniswap, from Balancer, from Curve, if you've watched the other videos, but if you have not watched it, it's simple. Uniswap is only between ERC20 tokens. Balancer is between a lot of different assets, so it's more than two, a lot of different assets. And Curve is only for assets with the same similar prices. So for example, Red BTC, um, Synthetic BT SBTC, and the TBTC, for instance. So all the similar assets with the similar price. So that's Curve. Bancor is different because Bancor uses Bancor also allows for interchain or interoperability between other different tokens. And all in general, all the formulas are similar. The, the concept is similar, but Bancor has a different formula, which gives us a little bit more room to play around with things. In any case, we'll not dive very deep into the math. Actually, we will not dive into math in this episode, so don't worry about it. Okay, so what are the tokens there in BNT or in Bancor? There are three tokens. The first one, as you can imagine, is the BNT token. So that's a native utility, to utility token for within the ecosystem. Then we have the trade token. So for example, the token that I want to trade. So in the cookie jar, you have two kinds of cookies. You have the BNT cookie, and then you have the other cookie that you'll be trading. So for example, this could be the Lisa token, this could be Link, this could be Comp, this could be YFI. It could be any tokens. And lastly, you have the pool token. So the thing about Uniswap is that when you add liquidity into the pool, so when you in Uniswap's cookie jar, when you add cookies into the cookie jar, you have to add the same amount of pumpkin cookie 
with leaf and pumpkin, pumpkin cookies without leaf. In Bangkok, it's quite different because this is what the version 2.1 has changed. You can add just only the pumpkin with leaves or just only the pumpkin without leaves. So that's a very, that's a very unique change. And this is where the pool token comes in, which is tradable, but we'll talk about that later. So the pool token talks about the ownership that you have based on the liquidity you put in into the pumpkin, uh, into the cookie jar. So let's say, uh, let's say in the cookie jar, you have 100 cookies, 50 BNT tokens and 50 Lisa tokens, or 50 BNT cookies and 50 Lisa cookies. And for, for Uniswap to be adding liquidity in there, you need to put an equal amount of BNT tokens and Lisa tokens. In Bangkok, it's quite different because in Bangkok, you, or in Bangkok's new edition, you can just add just the BNT cookies or just the Lisa cookies. That is where it's interesting. It gets very exciting. So the pool token just represents your ownership in the entire pool. If there are 99 tokens there, you add one token, one token in, you get 1%, you own 1% of the entire pool. That means if the pool earns 10 bucks, then you earn 10 cents out of this 10 bucks. 1% of everything. So that represents your ownership rights. So that's what the pool token is for. So looking at these three different tokens, what are the different functions and who adds to it? So for BNT tokens, it's a native utility token and it facilitates transactions between different kinds of tokens in the different liquidity pools. And you can, it's also able to cross chain. So with different layer one liquidity pools, who can add it in? You can, there are two types of in agents. The first agent are people, are users. These are liquidity providers. So they add BNT liquid into the BNT liquidity pool. And the second one, which is something very, very new, is this thing called the protocol. So the protocol adds liquidity into the pool as well. Think of it as a co-investment. If I, or like a grant by the government, if I as a startup are, I'm putting X amount of money into my startup, then the government can also co-invest an X amount of money into the startup as well. I don't know what other countries does that. I know that Singapore has that kind of system at least in the past, where if I put money into a startup to be growing a startup, the government wants to support startups. So the government is co-investing in your startup. Same concept, when, when I put Lisa tokens into this cookie jar, Bancor will mint BNT tokens and then put it into the, the cookie jar as well. We'll talk about those a bit later, but just give you an idea that for BNT to exist, it could, it could be owned by two types of people. It could be owned by the users and the protocol can be minting it as well as a form of co-investment. Then we have the second type of token, which is the trade token. So the Lisa token, the, the Wi-Fi token, the comp token, the Aave token, the, the link token, whatever you want. And it basically allows me to trade my Lisa tokens for the BNT tokens or for any other tokens in the system. Because in every of these cookie jar cookie jars, there's one common cookie that is in all these cookie jars. So I can always be exchanging my Lisa cookie for the common cookie jar, for the common cookie in the cookie jar, and then go to another cookie to get another token out. So that is the, the entire purpose of the BNT, to BNT token. It facilitates trade between all these different cookie jars. And who adds to it? It's only the users. This time the protocol is not involved because these the protocol can't mint or can't have any control over this external external tokens, right? So only people, the users, can add, can have access to the this protocol tokens or these trade tokens, and they add to that. So they become liquidity providers. And lastly, you have the pool token. I talked to you about the pool token just now. It is to represent ownership of the pool. So if I own 1% or 10% or 5%, then I'm getting that pool token represents that ownership in the pool. And it can, what does the, what does the ownership mean? It means that I can get specific amount of transaction fees that the pool generates. So if a lot of people are trading in that pool, there's a lot of transaction fees being generated. How do I know I have an, an amount that I can take? Well, it depends on the ownership. If I own 10% of the pool, then I own 10% of the revenues being generated. Very clear cut. And this token is also tradable. So who adds to it? This token is just created automatically. When you add liquidity, liquidity into the pool, then this pool token will be calculated and it will be given to you. So it 
it's almost like when you're when you're buying something this this you get a receipt in return so now this receipt represents your ownership to the thing that you just bought and it will just be created automatically when you buy the thing so when you put liquidity into the pool this this ownership token will just be minted now what are the changes then in the system the three main changes in Bancor V1, so Bancor V1 is the very basic level where you have Bancor BNT as the main token, as the denominator, and then you have all these different cookie jars of liquidity pools. And it, you know, people are adding tokens in there, adding BNT tokens in there, and then you just trade around. And the weights are always 50-50. So 50% BNT token, 50% Lisa token. 50% BNT token, 50% Link token. 50% BNT token, 50% Aave tokens. Now, in, that's Bancor V1. Bancor V2, which they did, they released recently, is to have dynamic weights. So I told you that their formula is quite different from Uniswap, right? So with Uniswap, the formulas, they're fixed. It's 50-50. With, with Bancor, they, they allow that formula, or they allow that number to change a little bit. It's similar to Balancer, you can change that number. So they tried playing around with it, and they tried to use oracles as an external source of truth and data to come in to have dynamic weights to allow for a better trade to reduce impermanent loss and to reduce price slippage. Well, that works in theory, but you know, arbitrage traders and then there's also time lag, so that didn't exactly work out too well. So instead, they went back to the static weight, which is the 50-50. And this is, you know, pretty much fixed in the formula. They just name it. They just put it as fifty fifty. So the same static weight as we see in Uniswap. So something that you know traders are comfortable with. You know that Uniswap uses that. You know a lot of these other other AMMs use that. So you you know that Bancor went back to that again. So that's good. The second change is insurance. So so the first change is going back to to the static the static weight, right? So it's fifty fifty, which means it goes back to the V one version. How is V1 version different from V2.1 then? Well, the difference is this insurance for impermanent loss. So, you know, impermanent loss is one of these big, big topics that everyone is talking about. We're always trying to figure out how to reduce impermanent loss. And I had a chat with Fernando from Balancer, Michael from Curve, and Nate from Bancor to talk about how to reduce impermanent loss and what can you do in the AMM formulas and mechanisms to reduce impermanent loss. We had a long chat about it. I'll link it up in, in the video so you can check it out. But in general, what we want to do is how do we reduce the risk for market makers? Because these people are, you know, the one actively doing market making. They shouldn't be having so much risk because they're actually, you know, like the good guys. So what can we do to reduce their risks that they hold? And one option is to provide insurance for them. So that's what V2.1 has done. And the third difference is dynamic supply. So they call it the elastic BNT supply. Basically, the supply of BNT will be minted and burnt based on the different kind of economic mechanisms that there are in place in the system, which we will go into. And let's go into the whiteboard session. So now let's move on to the whiteboard session. We're going to divide this entire piece into six different sections so we can understand what Bancor V2.1 is all about. And we're, we are going to get started with the easiest, single-sided liquidity pool. So we have a pool. And that's a liquidity pool. So a liquidity pool will be, you know, whatever the tokens will be in there. And what does single-sided mean? Single-sided there means that there, there are two sides to this liquidity pool, but you can only choose to put just one side. Either you can choose to put both sides or you can choose, choose to put one of either sides. So in this case, let's take a very simple example. And we just, let's say that only in single-sided liquidity pool, it's only filled by one side. So let's say, let's use the Lisa token, for instance. So we add for single-sided liquidity pool, then we add Lisa token into the single side. And who puts in the other side? That's Bancor, that's the protocol itself. So it will mint BNT tokens, so freshly minted BNT tokens to be added into the liquidity pool. So this BNT token is added by the Bancor protocol itself. 
and the Lisa token is added by the users, by these liquidity providers. So the concept, what is the concept that we have over here? The concept that we're talking about over here is co-investment. So a co-investment where one party puts something in and the VC, the investor, the, the advisor, they put an amount in as well. So they're co-investing in this liquidity pool. So they have both ownership towards this liquidity pool. But to keep things simple, let's say all the Lisa tokens are added by me, the liquidity provider, and all the BNT tokens are 100% added by, the, by Bangkok protocol itself. So in single-sided liquidity pool, then I'm adding the Lisa tokens and Bangkok is adding the BNT tokens. So now let's move on to part two. Part one, we talk about simple single-sided liquidity pool. Now part two, let's understand pool ownership. So that's the, the, another type of token available in Bangkok's protocol. Again, we have a pool. We have half of it that is Lisa token. And the other one is the BNT token, the Bangkok token. Now, remember, we keep this situation simple. So all the Lisa tokens are added by me. And all the BNT tokens are added by the protocol itself. So that means I own 50% of the pool, and Bangkok, the protocol, also gets to own 50% of the pool. And what does that mean? It means that for any fees generated, 50% of the fees will go to me, and 50% will go to, so you can imagine, the protocol itself. So the protocol can be generating revenue at the same time. That's the entire idea of co-investment, co right? You share your, your capital, but you also share the gains. So if let's say the fees are $10, $5 goes to me, and $5 it goes to Bangkok the protocol itself. And then we'll, you know, after that, it will be translated to the token prices after that, but we'll talk about that later. For now, just understand that this is how pool ownership works. I own X percent of the pool, so I get the X percent of the fees generated. And what is the concept that we are talking about over here? We are talking about equity and dividends. And now let's move to part three, impermanent loss. Impermanent loss is something that we've been trying to figure out for a very long time now. And some people claim to have figured it out. Some people are trying to figure it out. So when does it exist? To be honest, the easiest understanding of it is that it exists only when the liquidity provider withdraws the funds in the liquidity pool. That's why it's called impermanent. It's only, it only becomes permanent when it's being withdrawn. In that case, where does the loss come from? Well, the loss comes from the loss comes from a very simple way. If you have this capital, the two ways you can do about it. One is to keep it in your wallet, and one is to put it in these liquidity pools. So the loss comes from when you compare it if you keep these capitals in your wallet. And what can the liquidity provider withdraw? Remember, if you own 50% of the pool ownership, as we talked about in number two, then you can only take out 50% of whatever is in the pool. And so you take 50% of whatever is in the pool, and because the, the fees generated are in both LISA tokens and BNT tokens, right? But you only take the LISA tokens part of it. The BNT, when, you, when me as the liquidity, liquidity provider withdraws my ownership and share of the liquidity pool, then I will take 50% of whatever's in the pool and I will only take the LISA version or the LISA tokens because I only added LISA tokens. Even if there's BNT in there, I will not take them. What will happen to that? So... Let's look at two different scenarios of 
Let's look at two different scenarios when a liquid liquidity provider withdraws. So scenario one, the LISA tokens in the pool is more or equals to the amount of initial LISA tokens being put in. So if let's say I put in 10 LISA tokens, in the liquidity pools, there, there's 11 LISA tokens or 10 LISA tokens. And that's good because I actually get more than whatever amount I put in. The other situation is where the LISA tokens in, in the pool is actually less than the LISA tokens added. Now, that's interesting because if I put 10 tokens and in there there's only 9 tokens, then I'm suffering a permanent loss, right? And th this entire idea is to reduce impermanent loss. So let's go back to scenario 1 first because it's a lot easier, where the LISA tokens in the liquidity pool is actually more than in the initial amount that I put in. So there is enough liquidity. So what happens? Number 1, I get the LISA tokens from the pool which is the 50% of the entire pool. And then, because that's, that's because I'm entitled to it, right? I own 50% of the entire pool. So I get 50% of the pool. And I only get the LISA token version because I didn't put in any BNT. I'm not entitled to any BNT. So, and how does the BNT come about again? Because when transactions happen, the ownership, the transaction fees are paid either in BNT or in LISA tokens, depending on what are you trading. So when people are trading BNT in the, in the pool itself, I'm, my investment or my capital actually generates some BNT because of the transaction fees. And what happens to these BNT? These BNTs, they are burnt. So now you see that? They are burnt. Because I'm not entitled to any of these BNT, these BNT shouldn't be existence in, existing in this liquidity pool anyway because I'm removing all the capital. So the equivalent amount of BNT will be burnt. Very simple, very easy. Now, let's go to the other situation where there isn't enough liquidity, where the LISA tokens in the liquidity pool is less than the initial amount. So first, the system goes and checks the amount of LISA tokens required to give to the liquidity providers. For example, if I'm short by five LISA tokens, then the system will go and check. Okay, you know, how, how much is it specifically? Okay, five LISA tokens? Okay, that's, that's the amount that I need to find. Next. The system now knows how much to look for, right? Next, the system goes and checks the pool ownership. So remember, this is a co-investment. If in scenario one, there is enough liquidity and there's extra BNT tokens, this BNT is burnt. So it works on, these, on the same way as well. So Bangkok, as part owner, owners of this liquidity pool, every time there is LISA tokens being generated, they are not entitled to that as well. So what happens this, you can't burn them, as, you can't burn them. So, you, so it's possible for Bangkok protocol to, to have LISA tokens. So if there is excess LISA tokens, so let's say there's five LISA tokens, then the Bangkok protocol will take it and give the five LISA tokens to me, the liquidity, liquidity provider when I'm withdrawing. So this is the insurance part, insurance part where I don't lose my, I don't, I don't suffer impermanent loss. If there isn't, if there isn't enough, then they will mint BNT. They will mint BNT that's equivalent to the five LISA tokens that is in, in the market. And they use this based on the, based on the entire like, liquidity pool, which is basically an oracle. So when there's, not enough, when there's enough liquidity, BNT is burnt. So, and BNT price will go up. If there's not enough liquidity and there isn't enough LISA tokens to, to return to the liquidity providers, then BNT will be minted. And so, in general, the BNT price will go down. So that's the, the very general big picture of the two different scenarios where BNTs will be burnt or extra BNTs will be minted. Now that you have that understanding going on, let's go deeper to understand the insurance. Understand how insurance play a role in this aspect. So insurance really plays a role only in the second scenario in the two scenarios we talk about, where there isn't enough liquidity to return the tokens to liquidity providers. What's the purpose of insurance? In this specific case, this insurance is to protect the liquidity providers from impermanent loss. Only impermanent loss from liquidity providers. In the Nexus Mutual videos that we talked about, there are three main risks 
the internal technical risk, the external technical risk, and the third one is it's like the economic risk. And this will kind of be classified as an economic risk because of all these arbitrage, arbitrage traders, their trading and everything, you have, you're suffering this impermanent loss. So how do they structure the insurance? It's a very simple, straightforward way. So if we graph it out based on coverage and time, the first 30 days of you adding liquidity into the pool, you have zero coverage because they don't want people to be putting in for 30 days, do some funny business, get coverage, and then leave. So the first 30 days, you have zero, zero insurance covered. And then after 30 days, you will have additional 1% of coverage every single day until you reach the 100th day where you're covered 100%, and then the rest of the days, you're always covered 100%. So 100% is, is really the, the insurance. So if you only cover 30%, then then the liquidity pool, they will only return 30% of your impermanent loss. So in other words, put, it more than, put your tokens in for more than 100 days to get 100% coverage. Just a quick refresher, where does the insurance money come from? Where, where do you get all this liquidity? Two things. One is the pool ownership. So in, again, going back to scenario two, if the pool ownership by Bancor, because of co-investment, they will generate some LISA tokens. So these LISA tokens are not used anywhere, so they will be used as insurance coverage. So number one is pool ownership. Number two is minting BNT tokens. If there isn't enough for pool ownership to cover, then the system will be, will be minting BNT tokens that, of the equivalent amount of impermanent, impermanent loss and give it back to liquidity providers. So what we have, what have we covered right now? Number one, we've covered single-sided liquidity providers. Number two, we've covered impermanent loss. And number three, we've covered insurance of impermanent loss. And basically, these are the three things of Bancor's version 2.1. Now, let's make it a little bit more complicated. Let's look at double-sided liquidity providers, which exists, and how does it play well in the impermanent loss and insurance aspect? So, again, let's start the same way. We have a liquidity pool, and we start with adding LISA tokens. So step one, adding LISA tokens. And step two, the protocol will mint BNT tokens. Simple, right? So we start by filling the liquidity pool with assets, with tokens. Now, how can we make this a double-sided liquidity pool? So, this is where the BNT liquidity providers come in. What they do, they come in to replace the liquidity, the BNT that's minted by the protocol. So the BNT liquidity providers come in, they, and they remove the protocol that's minted, or the BNT that's minted by the protocol, okay? So this guy, he comes in, he adds BNT into that liquidity pool, and what happens to the liquidity pool inside that the protocol mints? So the, the existing ones that is done by the protocol, well, it gets burnt. This also means that all the fees generated will also be burnt. So to replace the protocol, the concept that we're talking about here is to replace the protocol's BNT with liquidity providers BNT. So the idea is that all liquidity in the pool is provided now by people, by users, not by protocols. This happens when the protocol is, or this liquidity pool is earning a lot of revenues, a lot of generating a lot of transaction fees, and it's very attractive for other people to come in. So people come in and people will replace the BNT that's minted by the protocol. So once again, going back to where does the, the insurance coverage come from? One, from pool ownership. So from 
And that works for single-sided, right? Because then from co-investment, the protocol itself can be generating fees as well. But for double-sided, remember, for double-sided, and if let's say there's no pool ownership by the protocol at all, then you automatically go to you automatically mint BNT tokens if there is if there is impermanent loss over there. Still, we could have kind of like double-sided plus protocol BNT involved if partially partial part of the BNT tokens are minted by the protocol and part of it are given by liquidity providers. And now let's move on to the, the last part, number six. BNT conclusion. So what we want what I want to summarize is how how will or when are the situations in which BNT will increase in supply? And when are the situations in which BNT will reduce in supply? Number one, it mainly increases in supply when you mint BNT for insurance. You could argue it increases in supply when you're minting BNT for the liquidity pool, but it never really reaches the secondary market. So it's quite hard to argue that way. It could in very, very rare situations. But let's take the general idea first. So you only have an increase in supply when there's insurance to be given out. When BNT is... How do you reduce supply? You burn BNT. And that exists in two scenarios. The first one is when there's sufficient liquidity and you don't need to, you don't need to cover for insurance and liquidity providers withdraw their liquidity, then the extra BNT earned will be burnt. So it's kind of like a share buyback concept. The second thing is when users replace the protocol's BNT as liquidity, liquidity providers and their fees generated during the entire process before the user come in to replace the protocol's BNT and then the fees will also be burnt. So the profits will be burnt. So in any case, burning of BNT in the scenario of Bancor version 2.1, it's all about burning additional revenue generated. So the concept that we're really talking about over here is a share buyback concept. That's for the whiteboard sessions. And let's go back to the slides to continue our session. All right, now back to the slides. Let's go through the last two sections. One is the economics of BNT, and second is the FAQ. So to summarize again, the supply will be affected in two ways. It either increases or decreases. It increases in supply when there is an impermanent loss insurance payout and there isn't sufficient tokens to be paying out. So you need to be minting BNT to pay out the insurance. However, the supply could also decrease in two, two scenarios. Number one, when the liquidity, liquidity provider withdraws their, their share of the liquidity pool and there are, there are BNT that's being minted or there's BNT accrued as revenue, then that BNT will be burnt. The second thing is when a liquidity provider replaces the protocol's BNT, the co-investment BNT, and there are, during that period, there are BNT being generated as part of the transaction fees, then those will also be burnt. So the concept is really a share buyback concept. Now, what about the BNT supply? So how, let's look deeper to understand the BNT supply. Number one, it increases. Mm. Now, let's look at the economics co concepts and consequences for these different new incentive mechanisms in place. Number one, it increases the liquidity pool's depth in the pool for trade. So now people are more incentivized to trade because there are, number one, because there's in, impermanent loss insurance, so there's insurance. It means that in the worst case scenario, at the end of the day, I will get the same amount of tokens as I put in my wallet. So that means I have no downside. Whether I put my tokens in the wallet or if I put my tokens in this liquidity pools, the, the outcome, the worst case scenario outcome is the same. So the value of the, the amount of tokens in the in the pool or in the wallet will be the same. But there's upside. There's no upside by putting my tokens in the wallet, but there is upside in putting my tokens in the liquidity pool because I can earn transaction fees as, as my upside, as my returns. So because of that, this incentivizes liquidity providers to be putting, instead of putting all the tokens in their wallets and sitting there for nothing, then they take it out and put it in the liquidity pools instead because at least they have a bottom line downside, which is the same as your wallets but they have a high upside by earning transaction fees. So this really increases the depth of the liquidity pools for trade. How does that affect traders? Well, because number one, 
when there's more liquidity in the pool, then I have a reduced price slippage. So that means me as a trader, I'm more, I'm more willing to trade in that pool because there's less price slippage. And if you have not heard about price slippage, I'll link it up in the video above and you can learn a little bit more about price slippage. It's basically the difference between the amount that you're promised to receive and the amount you actually receive. And that's because your liquidity pool is not deep enough, so you don't have enough capital and that's why your price fluctuates a lot more when a small trade occurs. So because of that, you have an increased transactions you, because there are so many benefits, right? It is beneficial for liquidity providers so these decentralized market makers, and that's good because you don't you you're hedging your risk. You don't have a, a big loss because you have insurance coverage. Number two, it's good for traders because by having more people, more capital in the pool, you have deeper pools. You have less price slippage, so you want to trade more. And when you're trading more, it also benefits all these liquidity providers once again because they're earning transaction fees. So, and when all these all come together. Then you also reduce the need to mint BNT tokens for insurance coverage. In fact, you're increasing the, the likelihood of BNT tokens being used because they are generating in transaction fees and then when they're being taken over by whatever systems that we talked about just now, these revenues will be burnt and then it will, it's like the share buyback concept and it will feed back to the price of BNT. So that is, that's the general idea and concept of BNT tokens. It's very interesting because the entire idea of these tokens is how do we use tokens to align incentives between these different participants or different agents in our ecosystem. And this mechanism looks like they've done it. So let's jump into FAQs. Frequently asked questions. I put it out on Reddit and on LinkedIn, I uh, know on YouTube, uh, no, I put it out on Reddit and Twitter to get some questions and that's asking, just asking around for questions that people have on BNT. So number one, is there, is there still a need to buy BNT tokens from the market? Because if the protocol is always co-investing, why should I buy BNT tokens, right? I mean, that's true. At the same time, by having BNT tokens and putting these BNT tokens in all these various pools, I mean, that's the common denominator, common denominator between all these pools, right? So if I put my BNT tokens, if I spread it out and put my BNT tokens in all of these different pools, I get to earn transaction fees from all the pools. So there is no need to buy BNT from the market because the protocol will do that. But I want to earn money and so I'm just going to get some BNT and put it in the liquidity pool and be earning my transaction fees. Because I've got coverage from insurance anyway, so why not? Right? There's no need, you just want to because there's money to earn. Second, would the value of BNT drop because there's less reasons to hold on to BNT? Well, I wouldn't say so because all of all the different incentives in place, all the incentives that I've been, I've been talking about throughout so far and all the economic concepts that are trying to align different agents together, different participants together, is to make sure that the value of BNT doesn't drop. It only drops in the main scenario where there's huge impermanent loss, there isn't enough tokens to cover it, so you have to be minting more BNT tokens. And that's where the BNT, more BNT will be minted and increase the supply of it, and hence creating a drop in the value. So in general, the incentives in place are trying to maintain the system, not to increase the value of the system, just maintaining the system so that it works for BNT to be the common denominator for the the, the utility token within the ecosystem. Now then, what is the function of a BNT token? As I mentioned, the entire function is a utility token. Previously in Bancor version 1, it is a common denominator to be trading within these decentralized liquidity pools. Now, there's a new twist to it. It's still the same thing. It still allows for transactions between these different liquidity pools. But as the system continues to evolve, users are getting more sophisticated, the economics have to be more sophistic sophisticated as well. So now, it's a cash flow token function. So number one, it generates transaction fees because you, you own part of this entire, you own part of this liquidity pool, just like usual market makers, you know. So you can get a cash flow, you can get the cash flow from all these transactions that's being given. And then because of the co-investment thesis, because you are able to generate, you're able to, the, the system, the protocol is able to generate revenue, and then the revenue will be burnt 
and be returned back to the system, not directly but indirectly via the very big picture, the macro environment or the macro economy of Bangkok, then your token can also enjoy some form of returns in that, in that sense. So it's not exactly a financial security in that sense, as in it's not an equity, I don't own, I don't own um, 20 percent of Bangkok's eco entire ecosystem, but the entire distribution of token and rewards work in a similar way. And next, this is interesting. Will the protocol be profit generating or risk or loss accruing? Well, it depends. So if you look at two different scenarios, so a good scenario is where the BNT fee income is has a you know forty percent linear yield, so it's annualized. So it's a pretty good scenario, healthy scenario. That means a lot of people are trading. You have a lot of transaction fees being generated, and at, in one year you have a good forty percent annual yield. You know, it's a very good scenario. And and then you you also have the the orange line, which is a liquidity protection. So this is the insurance and insurance at hundred percent volatility. So when there's a lot of trade going on, you have to insure a little bit more because that's where impermanent loss comes in, when there's more trade. But when there's more trade, you also get more fees, right? So then if you look at that different graphs that's being drawn out, then you realize that there is a very nice sweet point of about four months. Yeah, about four months. And that's where it's pro it becomes profitable. So that's in a good scenario. In a bad scenario, in the same concept, we don't earn 40% linear yield. We don't that's a lot. So in a bad scenario, let's say a lot of people are not trading. So we get just a 7.5% linear yield. However, the, the insurance is also not so high because not many people are trading, right? So you don't have that much impermanent loss. That's the only thing that they cover. They only cover impermanent loss. They don't cover price slippage or other risks there that's involved. So in that scenario, again, it's also about three months and then it'll be profitable. So in general, the whole concept is that sure nobody can tell you if this is absolutely profit generating and i'm not here to tell you that this is not investment advice however look at what the different incentives are when you map them out you realize that the way for the entire system to be profit accruing as business do as businesses do is to have your revenue to be higher than your costs and the revenue in this case is revenues from transaction fees and the cost is insurance cost, which is the impermanent loss. So by, by understanding that, by mapping them out, we can get the two different good and bad scenarios, of which about three months, things will stabilize. And if you think about it, three months, it's about 100 days. So 100 days is where you get 100% coverage of your, of your impermanent loss. So, you know, the math actually all works out. And lastly, is there any BNT inflation risk? Well, let's take a look at the five different forces at play. The first one, BNT goes down, and that's because and when BNT prices goes goes down, you know, so BNT becomes cheaper, then I will sell my Lisa tokens to buy BNT tokens. So, and then if BNT tokens go up, then I will sell BNT tokens to buy Lisa tokens. So that's the general, you know, the internal economics at play. It's working out for all the other. You know, that's like the the entire trade anyway. So I'm not going to explain it to you because I know you're smart enough. Now, this is number three. The third force at play is when there's pool slippage. So when pool slippage goes down because there's the, the liquidity pool has more depth, has more volume as we talked about just now, then the fees earns goes up because as a user, as a person to, to does exchange, then I definitely want to choose an exchange that has lower, pro, lower slippage, lower price slippage and the transaction fees are the same anyway, so I have no loss in that sense. So that's good. People want to trade more. And because of that, revenue goes up. Revenue goes up means that when revenue goes up, BNT will be burnt. But BNT will be burnt in two ways, remember? The first one is when me as the Lisa liquidity provider, I withdraw my, my tokens or my Lisa tokens in the liquidity pool, then the BNT generated by the protocol will be burnt. Or someone sees that, someone holding BNT sees that, oh, this pool is very, very profitable. I want to take over the position of the BNT provided by the protocol so that I can be earning these revenue. And so all the revenue generated by the protocol prior to that decision being made or prior to that, that transaction being made will all be burnt. So then 
the BNT supply will go down and technically the price will go up. All things stay the same. And lastly, the, the fifth force at play is when BNT is minted. So BNT, the supply of BNT will go up when more insurance will be needed to protect the liquidity providers. So if that's the forces at play, what we want to do is to reduce the cost, to, to reduce the chances of insurance payout. And one way to do that is to have to allow for deeper liquidity pool, to have more trade to come in, and to encourage people to be adding trade into the system and to be trading more so that the revenue will actually increase. So that's it for this week's topic on Bancor's version 2.1. I hope you enjoy it. And if you have any questions, just link them in the comments below and I'll answer to that. In the meantime, check out other videos and I'll see you next week. Bye.